Welcome to the Once and Future Authors Podcast. I'm Stephanie, and I'm so excited to be joined by new author, Derek Schuster. Derek is the author of Youth in Jeopardy. Youth in Jeopardy is for concerned parents and professionals who want practical approaches based on the author's 20 years of working with at-risk teenagers. And I'm so excited to be joined by our author today. Welcome, Derek Schuster. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Stephanie. Pleasure to uh, have this conversation. Absolutely. And, and, and as the parent of, well, I only have one teenager left, the other two aged out. Um, certainly, I, I'm delighted to, to read the book, and I'm sure so many of our audience members, whether they have teens, had teens, or still reeling from the teens, this is definitely a valuable book, but but tell me, I, I know why I need your book, but as a professional, why do you think that this was a, a good book that was needed at this time? Well, I think that uh, people nowadays, they see so much uh, uh, discussion in the media about the violence and uh, they want to understand the causes and particularly they want to understand what can be done about it, about youth violence. And they uh, would like to, um, you know, have some practical approaches as parents and as uh, uh, professional caregiver givers, uh, what role they can play in reducing the amount of violence. Um, I, that that's you, know. a, you you're you're absolutely right. Every day we read something in the news. Yes. Well, I mean, the thing is that uh, a lot of um, what's been written about this topic has been from the academic perches of university professors and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't have the amount of practical experience in the streets of the Bronx or in the homes of the downtrodden areas of the Bronx that I can bring to the table. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell me about that experience in the Bronx. How long have you been working with youth? Well, um, I've been uh, working you know, with in various ways with youth. Um, uh, I mean, I, I'm the myself the parent of uh, six uh, people who have uh, been in their teenage years. I've been uh, a teacher, you know, so I can bring that perspective. Uh, and I've been working um, for uh, most of my career in various types of prevention programs. Uh, first of all, drug abuse prevention, working for the city of New York. Then I started Family Dynamics, my uh, child abuse prevention program, and then most recently in violence prevention. Wow. Uh, you were a teacher before that. What led you into these prevention programs? That seems like you really, you really wanted to face it head on there. Well, uh, what really led me into it was... Um, you know, seeing all of this crime from from really an early age where I, my school boarded on East Harlem and I saw a lot of uh, criminal behavior going on. Um, and I said, you know, why do we have to get to that stage? Why not develop preventive programs, you know, that can work before we get to the stage where somebody has to be incarcerated and so forth? Absolutely. And and there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of anger going on. Why why is there so much anger? Well, um, you know, the kind of things that make uh, teenagers angry are uh, when people trash talk about their families or they invade their space uh, or the parents say no to them when they want to hear yes, mm -hmm. you know, for some request. Um, so uh, what's very important is to help youth understand what triggers their anger um, before they get involved in assaulting somebody or in a case of domestic violence. What we've done is we've developed an anger detection instrument uh, so that uh, we're able uh, early on to understand how somebody develops an angry personality, what are the factors? And uh, so that helps us get to the root causes of the angry personality much quicker and do something about it. I love that. So, so your program and thus your book 
is is not just dealing kind of reactively when things are already happening, but trying to dial it back to before things happen. Is that am I reading? Yeah. That? Yes, that is true. Uh, and our program, incidentally, is for an organization in New York, uh, a quite fairly large organization called Scan Harbor. Scan Harbor, terrific. And and that makes perfect sense for anything, whether it's it's teens with anger issues or any of us, if we're just dealing reactively once things happen, that's when you end up with, like you said, drugs, violence, crime. Whereas if you can dial it back to why things are happening, you know, why are they angry in the first place? Uh, why Why is, it, people act impulsively too. That seems to be a trait of, of teens in general. Um, is there a why to that? Well, um, one's brains are not fully developed till about the age of 24. Mm -hmm. So uh, a teenager lacks impulse control and is subject to angry outbursts. And um, contributing also to that is that there are many uh, youth that we provide services for who are on their screens for five to 10 hours a day, believe it or not. Uh, so they have remote relationships. They don't feel empathy toward potential victims. In other words, they uh, don't really care about what happens to other people the, the way uh, they would if they were had more in-depth in-person relationships. And also um, teenagers just generally feel uh, that they uh, are invulnerable uh, so that they take uh, much greater risks than, than they should. Absolutely. Uh, Derek, I want to ask you about something you just mentioned, um, having to do with screen time versus kind of in-person contact, how um, that screen time or having relationships there kind of makes people, and we're talking about teenagers now, feel as if... Uh, consequences don't matter because on screen they don't. Is, is that, am I hearing that correctly? Well, uh, you know, screen time it can provide its own uh, set of um, uh, unfortunate circumstances, particularly the way kids will post uh, anything from nude pictures to, uh, you know, regrettable incidents. Uh, so, um, it, it's, you know, not only is it the amount of screen time, but it is uh, what is being posted mm. by them and about them. Yeah, yeah. I, it has what happened over the past couple of years as far as COVID and lockdowns and things like that, has that affected teens even more so because of the lack of face time, shall we say? Yes, uh, it... Um, you know, uh, basically got kids into a routine where uh, they were uh, spending so much time in remote superficial relationships that uh, they didn't come to value the importance of face-to-face -face relationships. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, basically with remote relationships, um, you uh, don't really have to learn how to deal with and form relationships with people as much because, you know, it's very easy to just exit the relationship, rather, you know, much more so than face-to-face -face relationships. That's very true. Um, how about teens in school? Are are the schools stable or are they cutting school or what are, what are our biggest issues with teenagers as students? Well, about 28% of the children uh, nationwide cut school on a regular basis. So that's very unfortunate. Also, uh, parents don't uh, force them to go to school in many cases, and they don't check up where they go instead of going to school. The reality is that uh, they may be joining gangs, uh, meeting at when they should be going to school, and, um, you know, in, in uh, a lot of cities with particularly federal housing projects, you get, for instance, the kids in the Washington 
houses next to the Jefferson houses who become enemies to each other and, and exhibit gang-like violent behavior, often involving weapons. And um, so uh, there's a real downside, not only in missed education, but in what they're doing instead of going to school. Absolutely. And, and that violence that they're doing on the streets, let's say, is that extending into the schools then as well? Well, it is. Um, we've done a, a kind of a study at, at uh, uh, the factors that seem to create uh, violence in the schools. One is they start with play fighting, uh, you know, which, which seems innocent enough, uh, but uh, that kind of gets transformed into real fights within the school or outside the school because somebody uh, somebody's play fight is another person's real fight. Uh, so it, it turns it up a notch. And then there's sniping, uh, really ugly, rude comments that, that uh, further poison relationships. And then you get a situation in schools where there's certain kids who are known as the protectors, you know. So uh, they basically will rescue other kids from their enemies and create a gang-like atmosphere within the school. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a busy dynamic going on. You know, we hear so much about bullying also. That seems to be the, the biggest buzzword going on. What can you tell me about how it seems to be on the increase? Well, um, you know, I think, um, as I, I stated earlier, there's the lack of empathy for mm -hmm. other kids, you know, based on these remote relationships, it right. creates a way of treating other people. Mm -hmm. And um, it, the, you know, what we try to do is help the victims know how to react to bullying and help the bullies understand what is motivating their behavior. Usually it has something to do with power, the desire for power. And then there's this uh, recent dynamic with cyberbullying, particularly with girls. And uh, they, um, you know, we try to uh, help kids know how to avoid cyberbullying and how to react to it when it happens. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and cyberbullying, you can't get away from. You know, we always have our, our devices with us at this point. Yeah. That's, that's, that's rough. But you're actually dealing with the victims of bullying, shall we say, and the bullies themselves. Yes, yes. Wow, that's that's amazing. And that's a great way to, like you said earlier, nip things in the bud. And you said a lot of this has to do with that, that kind of disconnect between, uh, you know, being empathetic about people. Is, is self-esteem part of this as well? A person's self-esteem? I always think that bullies actually don't really like themselves. Well, I think uh, self, low self-esteem is very much uh, connected to uh, antisocial behavior. If people don't feel they're important and valuable, they take enormous risks because the what are the consequences going to be? You know, they, they, um, they're already in a bad situation, so how much worse can it be? Hmm. We try to teach them uh, ways of... Um, creating activities that can increase their self-esteem. They might be physical activities, non-physical ones, volunteer uh, work, um, anything that can make them feel good about their ability to accomplish something useful. You said about self-esteem that lack of self-esteem makes people do risky behavior because they're not concerned about consequences. Uh, does it lead to more criminal activity in that sense? Yes, uh, very, very much so. Uh, you know, you uh, see few criminals with high self-esteem, you know. Okay. If you put them through a kind of an interview process, that becomes very apparent. Interesting. I, I guess I'm, I'm picturing the television criminal who who looks very self-assured, but I guess that's a facade that they- Yes, can't... yes, you're exactly right on that, I believe. <laughs> yeah, if, if I were really to uh, sit down or if I were a professional like you and analyze the situation, 
it was all it was all facade that I was seeing. Does that self-esteem or lack thereof also lead to suicide? Because the suicide rate for teenagers is just way too Yes. Much. I mean, the people who are candidates for suicide feel they have little reason to live. They are very isolated from their families, have few friends, mm. no interests. And uh, so they don't feel really important. Um, and also contributing to uh, suicides or mental health problems, some, some very severe, that make it in a, impossible for the uh, prospective uh, suicide candidate to um, solve problems which uh, you know, are, are rampant in their life. So things just get worse and worse. Oh my goodness. So you, you and your organization do work with teens who are contemplating suicide as well? Yes, I mean, uh, there are about 15% of, of uh, teenagers have contemplated suicide. So, so it, it, it's really hard to avoid that population tragically. Um, and um, uh, I think uh, in uh, females, you know, the percentage is a little higher than in males. I didn't realize that. That's that's a shame to hear those numbers. That really is, mm -hmm. and and frightening for all parents out there. Yeah, really frightening. Um, it's an interesting thing, though. We have we have teens, as you're describing them, who are. Um, often angry. We have teens who are often with low self-esteem, but we also seem to have an issue in our society, and this is not just teens, but grown-ups, of entitlement. That's that's kind of an interesting thing that's going on there. Why is that? Well, um, a lot of it has to do with the media, okay? Uh, we're all bombarded with uh, LeBron James's latest you know, high-end sneaker that everybody just to have or the super smartphone that you can't do without. So um, kids begin to develop a, a feeling that, uh, you know, if it's on the media this much, then it means everybody's entitled to have one of those. And uh, no matter what, you know, how they go about it, that they're entitled. So um, what we work with parents and caseworkers to do is is really get youngsters to see that what they're actually entitled to in life is a roof over their head, food, clothing, education, and medical treatment, you know, and that that's about it. Not the John LeBron James James's sneakers, etc. And, and 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 are you successful with that? Getting them to understand what what we all get and what LeBron James gets. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we prefer to work with younger teenagers. Um, <laughs> you know, un unfortunately, uh, when they get to be you know fifteen or sixteen, uh, there are a lot of things that are very hard to reverse. For instance, uh, the power relationships between power and uh, between parent and child have sort of shifted in the direction of the child. So um, uh, the earlier we can work with them, the more likely we're able to deal with issues such as entitlement. No, no, I get that. And and as I said, I think this is a, a grown-up problem as well. Um, <laughs> like you said, everyone sees everything. So if uh, if Kim Kardashian is is able to own all this stuff and go on this island, we should all be allowed to do that as well. Um, right. It is kind of in our face. It really is in our face so much. Yes. So uh, working with younger teens does make sense. The sooner, almost like a, if it were a physical medical issue, the sooner something is dealt with, the better. Right. You know. So so tell me about your program, how, how do you measure success for your program then? How mm -hmm. do you know that it's working? Well, uh, the way we measure success is we track nine forms of behavior. 
Uh, examples are weapons possession, gang membership, and so forth. And um, the most important uh, measure of success is whether kids become arrested or rearrested. In the case of rearrest, we're able to reduce rearrest by 70%. Uh, so that is quite significant. And then lately, uh, you know, with the uh, possession of guns by teenagers having gone way up, uh, we uh, uh, are very glad we have had a self-defense program. What we do is we um, teach 12 defensive skills. So if the kids are being harassed in the streets, they don't feel like they have to carry a weapon uh, because they can defend themselves without having one. So in the last three years, of uh, the kids who have been through our self-defense program, not one has subsequently been arrested on a gun charge. So we're very pleased about that and, and hope that, um, you know, that trend continues for us. Wow, that's, that's interesting. I, I never thought about uh, the ability to defend yourself as, as overriding that need that they feel to carry a weapon. That's a great, a great connection and a great way of uh, taking a, a negative into a positive for your program. Yeah, I mean, that's most happens in lower income communities where uh, tragically it's very easy to access weapons. Interesting. Um, does your, in your programming, um, when you're working with teens, are they coming to you or are you visiting them in the home? Well, we, we're big believers in home visits. Uh, when they, you set up an appointment for an office visit, uh, they often don't show. Uh, but when you go to the home, you see the problems that are involved, the empty refrigerator, the uh, difficulty of having functioning relationships within the family. Uh, and you also see the resources that can be brought to bear on the problems. Uh, there you see the extended families, the neighbors who all could be assets in the situation. Um, but in saying that, um, not all home visits are uh, work all that favorably. And just to um, give you an example of that, let me mention uh, a, a situation we had with Roger. Um, so we came to, uh, Roger hadn't been going to school. So uh, I came to uh, pick him up and bring him to school. It was a freezing day in February. And so when I arrived, Roger was looking for his shoes. And he said, um, you know, I just can't find them. And so he had all his family members looking around for his shoes. And after a while, I just kind of gave him, he said, you know, I don't know where they are. So. I gave up, but I decided I'd hang around outside the door. And uh, I came in about five minutes later and amazing, every, every, everybody had found his shoes. And uh, so off we went to school. But this is sort of uh, the, my book, Youth in Jeopardy, uh, has a lot of amusing stories about manipulative teenagers. This is just one little example. Uh, and a lot of um, the readers, I'm sure, have come across manipulative teenagers. But, um, you know, I think beyond the technique of dealing with teenagers, uh, there's some entertainment value in just the manipulative, you know, creativity that they seem to have. <laughs> well, I'm glad you mentioned that um, the book has stories, you know, narratives, because it's one thing to learn from a checklist, you know, this, 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 but to really read it, you say, oh yeah, I've, I've been with a, a teen that refuses to, to, you know, hides the sneakers or can't find them or something in order to cut school. And, and reading that enlightens me. My eyes open and say, yeah, been there, been there, done that. <laughs> I guess when you're in the home visit also, you can see whether there's any good communication between uh, parents and, and other children. 
What that seems to be a problem with people is communicating with their teams. What can be done about that? Well, um, we, uh, you know, in a lot of families, the parents and children, they sort of pass each other in the hall. They don't really speak in any meaningful way. So we create um, uh, a situation where they've agreed to have daily parent-child communication. So uh, what they need to agree to is the amount of, amount of time, when the time will be, we'd suggest at least 10 minutes, uh, a location with some privacy in the home, uh, and the uh, a commitment to share their experience to, to become entwined in each other's lives so that they're not just passing each other in the hall, uh, but um, uh, their discussions shouldn't just be about discipline when the child screws up, but one would hope that they have other more meaningful things to share about their lives. And then uh, we also are, are big believers in family meetings where as many members of the family as possible come together to uh, discuss any problems, anything that could be better in terms of the uh, living in the family, uh, with the family, and uh, to do some problem solving. So uh, we help them create a structure for the family meetings as well. That's a great idea. I, I, I like that whole structured approach. Every day, 10 minutes, private location, sharing about things other than discipline. You know, I'm sure those first several meetings are very awkward, but if it's consistent, it would build. Yep. Oh, that's great. Uh, I know that in your program, and, and I just was so curious about this, that you bring kids to prisons. Why do you do that? What's to benefit? Well, uh, we, first of all, uh, we, we, want, we want them to have additional reasons to avoid being arrested. Um, so when you they visit a prison, they see the horrible conditions, the lack of privacy, um, uh, you know, everything is done on the prison schedule. There's no opportunity for the inmates to uh, have input into how things are done in a prison. So they see all of that. Uh, in addition, they get a chance to speak with trained inmates who uh, many are there for 10, 20 years or more of their lives. They've missed out on so much, their children's birthday parties. Uh, their lives are so empty. Some of them hardly get visited at all. And uh, what we want to do is um, get the kids who we bring to the prison to see parallels between uh, how the inmates describe when they were teenagers, what life was like. Uh, to uh, the lives of, of the teenagers we bring. And hopefully what this will do is, this will um, get them to see that they could end up in a horrible place like this uh, before it's too late. And, and then we come back to our uh, center and discuss what went on in the prison. And almost uh, all the kids swear up and down they will never allow themselves to end up in a place like that. Oh, that, that sounds like a great, a great technique, especially um, having them speak to people who are there about their own experiences uh, to really dissuade them. Well, I'm, you've given us a whole lot of food for thought. I definitely want to remind our um, viewers here, Youth in Jeopardy for Concerned Parents, Professionals, who want practical approaches based on the author's 20 years working with at-risk teenagers, 20 plus, and it's coming soon. So you'll definitely want to grab your copy. Uh, Derek, thank you so much for joining me today and for all these insights. Definitely eye-opening, and you've given us a whole lot of food for thought. Thanks. Appreciate the opportunity, Stephanie. So long.